Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. When I finally got to the point where I found these nine magical godly words. Want me to tell you what my nine words are that probably saved my marriage? I think I'm right, but I could be wrong. I have a message for you that is going to take a lot of stress out of your life. It is going to make your life so much better. The title is called Out of Control and Loving It. <laughs> out of Control and Loving It. And I'm not talking about you being out of control and doing whatever you want to do. I'm talking about stop trying to control other people and circumstances, and even sometimes God, and learn how to let go of that stress, and you'll love it. We're going to talk in a minute about four different reasons why we try to control things, but there's two ways we can look at this. First of all, you don't want to let anybody control you. That's not God's will for your life. It's not good for them, and it's not good for you. And you don't want to be trying to control other people. This is especially difficult sometimes for parents who have grown children. It's hard to be in a position of guiding someone and pretty much telling them what to do and how to do it pretty much all their life and now all of a sudden they don't want you doing that anymore. They don't appreciate your advice. They don't take your advice. They get mad when you give them advice. And it's hard sometimes to let go of that. But it's a transition that everybody has to make. And if you want to get along with your grown children, then you have to come to a point where you realize that they have the same right that you do, and that is to make their own decisions. Even if the decision they're making is bad, it's still theirs to make. And sometimes the only way they can learn what to do and what not to do. How many of you know we don't always learn by somebody else telling us what to do and what not to do? It's not that your advice may not be good, but a lot of times people just have to learn by going through things. But I want to start by telling you a story. Dave and I went to a church a long time ago, um, and I don't know if you know it or not, but you know, churches sometimes can have clicks in them just like out in the world. You know, there's like a certain group that If you want to be in the list of who's who in the church, then you need to be in with that group. Well, I didn't know back then what I know now, and I was pretty insecure still from the things I'd gone through in my childhood, and I was looking for significance and looking for worth. And so when, we, when we're doing that, a lot of times we think that our value increases if we can be friends with somebody who is the right person to be friends with. So I wanted to get in with this certain group of people in the church, and I tell you, I worked at it really hard. I manipulated, I gave compliments to the right people, I called the right people, I did everything those right people wanted me to do, and I wanted Dave to be an elder in the church. I don't know if he wanted to or not, but I wanted him to. And A lot of the guys in this group were elders in the church, and so I thought, you know, if they like us, then they will probably get asked to be an elder. And I wanted him to be an elder because I was nosy and wanted to know everything that was going on <laughs> and wanted to help run the church. And so finally I got in with this group of people. But in order to, uh, if you get a relationship by letting people control you, then you're always going to have to do what you did to get it. And eventually, you're going to get tired of it. Well, in 1976, God touched my life. I was filled with the Spirit, and he called me to start teaching a Bible study. Well, you know, those people that I worked so hard to get that relationship with were the first ones to turn their back on me and want nothing to do with me anymore. So I'm just going to tell you, if you want right friends and good friends, then you're really kind of better off not to pick them out yourself, but to ask God for divine connections. 
And who God puts you together with may not be the person that you would have chosen, but you're much better off to have a right relationship that's healthy than to have one that you chose and manipulated and maneuvered around to get for yourself and then end up getting hurt. Can somebody say amen? amen. All right. So, first reason that we'll talk about, well, first of all, let me just ask, do we have any people here that like to be in control? I guess I should find out first if I've got any people here that need my message tonight or, <laughs> or if I should just, you know, forget it. But um, the first reason we can talk about, about why we like to be in control is just simply we're afraid that if we don't control the situation that we won't get what we want. And basically, we all pretty much want what we want, and we work pretty hard to get it. And um, Jesus said, it's recorded in Mark 8, if anybody wants to be my disciple, let him forget himself and let him come after me. The Amplified makes it really good. It says, forget himself, lose sight of himself and all of his own interests, and take up his cross and follow me. So selfishness as far as biblical teachings are concerned is a big no-no. We're supposed to learn how to care really more for others and their happiness than we do for our own. Now, I don't know about any of you. I don't know how long you've been walking with God or how spiritual you are, but I'm still working on that. <laughs> is anybody else here still working on, you know, not just let, let, me, let me tell you something. If you cannot get what you want and still be happy and have a good attitude, you're pretty far up the scale on spiritual maturity. How many of you cannot get what you want and still stay happy? About 20% of the crowd. Thank you for being honest. I'm better, but I still got a ways to go. The desire to control is rooted in selfishness. Just a couple of scriptures on selfishness just to kind of get us grounded. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 5. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. Say that with me. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not ir irritable, and it is not resentful. You know, sometimes when we fight and argue with somebody to get our way and we win, we really haven't won, we've lost. Dave and I needed a picture at one point for some wall in our house, and we were at the mall shopping, and there was a store there that sold pictures, and Dave and I don't have the same taste in decorating, <laughs> not even, like, remotely close. Dave wants everything in the room to stand out, and I want everything to match and blend. And so he saw this picture that he really liked. Didn't matter that I thought it was gonna look crazy on the wall because it didn't have anything to do with anything else going on in the room. And I, there was another picture that I liked that he didn't like. And so, you know, you know where it goes from here, right? And so Dave's a real peace-loving guy and he's not real big on fighting and arguing. And he, uh, he finally just said, I, I don't care, do what you want. So I'm walking down the mall and I could just feel my, this little satisfaction in my flesh. <laughs> Come on, you ever just feel that? It's like, yeah, I got my way. But you know, I heard the Holy Spirit say, you think you won, but you actually lost. Because the way that I went about it was not a godly way. You see, God wants us to delight ourselves in Him and let Him give us the desires of our heart. He doesn't want us manipulating and trying to control situations because if you get 
what you want that way, then really you didn't win, you lost. You may have gotten the thing you wanted, but you displeased God about the way that you got it. Philippians 2, 3 says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Now that doesn't mean that you're not important, we're all important, but not one of us in this room is any more important than the rest of the people in the room. Amen? And we're gonna talk about pride in a few minutes. I don't know if you wanna talk about pride, but we're gonna talk about pride for just a little bit. Let me ask you a question. Is, is there any, somebody that you love that you're trying to make them love Jesus like you do, but they're not interested? <laughs> they, when we have a relationship with God and we know what people are missing and we love people, we so much want them to love God. And we try all of our different things. We drag them to meetings. We leave books open at just the right place. We <laughs> turn Joel on real loud, hoping that they'll walk through the room and hear just the right thing. And uh, I'm just going to tell you a secret. Save yourself a lot of stress. <laughs> you cannot make somebody love God. Can't do it. Now, God may use you in their life, but they're probably not going to be won by conversation. If anything, they might be won by your godly behavior and godly example in front of them. Now, one of the reasons why I'm doing this teaching is because I had a little problem earlier in the year. Well, not a little problem. I had a pretty big problem with I got sick, didn't know what was wrong, didn't know what was wrong, and had every kind of test you could have, and they said, I'm just so healthy, it's ridiculous, and I'm like, well, then why am I falling apart? And basically came down to chronic stress, just working too hard, too long, but a lot of my work was not, I mean, I work externally, I do conferences, I write books, I do television, but for me, it came down to a lot of it was internal. A lot of it was things like this, like trying to control situations that I couldn't control. Or like, you know, say like one of my kids is late all the time. He's just not good at being where he's supposed to be on time. Well, you know, I don't like that. And so I try to talk him into changing or I try to guilt him into changing. And, and he doesn't like that. And so then that causes a problem. And you know, you finally just have to get to the point where you're like, you know what, God, it is not my problem. Come on, is anybody out there? There's only so much that you can do, and God gives everybody a free will. God never tries to control us or force us or manipulate us or guilt us into anything. The devil does. He's a manipulator and a controller. So when we try to do that to people, we're actually operating in more of an evil nature rather than a godly nature. God shows us what to do. He leads us. He guides us. He tells us the consequences of doing what he says and the consequences of not doing what he says, but he never tries to make us do it. He leaves it up to us. We have free choice. We have free will. And if you ever want to have any friends that last for very long, you have to give them that same freedom where you're not trying to control them and make them do what you want them to do. Same thing in marriages. Same thing with your kids. I have four grown kids, and I have a really good relationship with all four of them. But I'll tell you what. I've had to learn to mind my own business. <laughs> and you have to learn your kids are different. Now, you know, I've got one daughter. I can give her advice all day long. She don't care. It's fine. She'll do it if she wants to. She don't. She don't. 
But she never, she never minds me giving her the advice. It doesn't bother her that I give it to her. And then I have other children that it's like, don't try to tell me what to do. <laughs> so you have to kind of, you have to know people and you have to learn how you can function. You know, I mean, I'll admit it, I love to give advice. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm a teacher. I mean, I'd like to tell everybody what to do. And I would be pretty sure that I'd be right. But here again, <laughs> if you want to have any friends or if you want your marriage to last, come on now. You got to learn that you're not going to get your way all the time and you can't control everything that's going on. I'm going to really help somebody tonight. Somebody here tonight is going to get a lot. I'm telling you, it is hard work trying to run the world. I mean, it just like keeps you internally busy all the time, constantly. This thing about trying to make people love God, I mean, it was made clear in Joshua 24, 15. If it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So he made his decision and he said, now you make your decision. God has given us so much free choice that honestly, he will even protect somebody's right to go to hell if that's what they're determined to do. God will not try to force us into doing what's right. 1 Corinthians 10, 24 says, let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. I'm glad that God just keeps working with us until the day he comes back to get us. Because I'll tell you, when I read scriptures like that, I think, Joyce, after 42 years in the word, you still need a lot of help. How many of you agree this selfishness thing is pretty, pretty challenging? I mean, we just, we want what we want. The second reason why we try to control situations and people is pride. Just plain old pride, which is also self. It's I, me, what I want. We don't like the decisions that people are making, and we're pretty sure that if they would just do what we think they should do, that their life would be so much better, because after all, we know more than anybody else does. None of you are like that, I'm sure. The desire to control is rooted in pride. Romans 12, 3, for by the grace given unto me, I warn everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to. Now, it doesn't say you should have a poor opinion of yourself, but it says don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to, or another way to say it is don't think you're better than other people. Don't think you're smarter than other people. I can tell you there are some things that you can do that other people can't do. But here's the part we miss. There's also things they can do that you can't do. Okay, I'll say that again because somebody missed it. You know, <laughs> there are, like for example, you know, the reason why so many marriages get in trouble is people get married and then they try to change the other person to be just like they are. And the whole thing is, is you're usually drawn to somebody that has what you don't have. And God's idea is that by the two becoming one, then they become a whole person because Dave has gifts, I have gifts, but I spent the first, I don't know how many years of our marriage trying to make him do what I wanted him to do. And I can tell you, it just doesn't work. People resent you. Come on. People resent you when you try to control them. And even if you manage to do it, it'll never be a healthy relationship. And so I would say that our marriage probably really began when we shook hands one day and said to each other, I accept you just the way you are, and I will not try to change you. <laughs> hey. 
And that doesn't mean that you never, you know, if, if I was behaving badly, Dave would correct me. It doesn't mean you never give each other any advice. But there's a difference in that and trying to make somebody be the way you want them to be. I'll tell you a secret. God wants us to love people as they are, not the way we want them to be. Amen. And boy, that sure comes into play when we think about our kids. The Bible says train up a child in the way they should go according to their own individual gift or bent or personality. There's nowhere in the Bible that it ever says that a parent is to try to make a child do what they want them to do. God gives us children, but they're really his, and he wants us to find out what their gifts are, help them decide what God wants them to do, and not try to live our unfulfilled dreams through them. And so many parents do that. How many kids are just, they're miserable because they're doing something for mom or dad because that's what mom and dad want and it's not even what they want or what they like. So you're gonna enjoy your life a lot more if you give people the freedom to make their own decision. Now, obviously, I'm not talking about a three or four year old child. You can't just say, well, honey, I just wanna set you free and <laughs> you just do whatever you want to. But I'm talking about the cycle of life where gradually, by the time your kids are getting to be teenagers, you gotta give them a little more freedom and a little more freedom and a little more freedom. And I can tell you, by the time they're around 18 to 21, you better be ready to let go because something happens in every person at that point and they want independence. They even want the right to make their own mistakes. How many of you have a hard time letting your kids make their own mistakes? It's challenging not to get involved in it, isn't it? I know exactly what you mean. And it never stops, no matter how old they get. We don't like decisions that people make and we are absolutely certain that we would do a better job than they would. By the grace of God, I warn everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Here again, God does not want you to have a bad opinion of yourself. Don't think low, bad, condemning thoughts about yourself. But it's kind of good to say to yourself a couple of times a day, you know, I'm no better than anybody else. And there's things I'm good at, but there's things they're good at that I'm not good at. So there's things I'm good at that maybe Dave's not as good at, but there's a lot of things that he's really good at that I'm not good at. And usually when we're having problems in relationships, pride is always at the base. Matter of fact, you can't have an argument if, if pride is not involved. Pride is involved in every divorce, and it's usually both people thinking they're right and neither one of them being willing to even consider that they might be wrong. When I finally got to the point where I found these nine magical, godly words. Want me to tell you what my nine words are that probably saved my marriage? I think I'm right, but I could be wrong. <laughs> it's amazing how it disarms people if you're arguing about who's right about something. If you will at least be humble enough to consider that you maybe possibly could be wrong. Now, you know, Dave, at this point, because we've been married a long time, we got this all worked out. Let me tell you something. You might as well keep the one you got, because if you go get a new one, you're just going to have to start all over. <laughs> and if you keep the one you got, somewhere around about 30, 35 years, you finally just decide, hey, it ain't worth it. You do, you, you do. I mean, we just have the greatest relationship now. I do what I want to. He does what he wants to. We're just all as happy as we can be. Well, everybody wants to be free from controlling people and circumstances. But true freedom comes internally when we surrender to the work of Jesus Christ and his transforming power in us. He can change us from the inside out.
10 miljoen gevangenen zitten wereldwijd vast. Het is een hostile territory hier. Prison. En ik spreek in proof van dat. Zij die achter zulke muren leven zijn mensen. En Jezus vraagt ons om naar hen om te kijken. Ik ben hier voor een third degree burglary. Ik heb een lengthy sentence van 400 months. De judge looked at me and said. I'm going to sentence you to spend the rest of your natural life plus 20 years behind these prison walls. A lot of people don't have family here, so they feel forgotten. There's not a lot of people beating the door down to get in here to see us. That outreach of the hand to touch their lives in a personal way, to, to come visit them, to, to see that somebody is really thinking about them, that somebody cares for them on the outside. You're giving to people that really are like at the bottom of the totem pole. And with your giving, that, uh, that's actually bringing somebody up. It's the fact that you thought about us, even if it was just to come by and have prayer. We just feel loved, you know, that we're not pieces of garbage, you know, um, thrown away. Um, that somebody does value us still. And that there is hope, there's hope for us. Tot nu toe hebben we meer dan 3600 gevangenissen bezocht. Zijn er meer dan 3 miljoen cadeautasjes uitgedeeld. En meer dan 139.000 gevangenen hebben voor hun leven met Jezus gekozen. Heb je een vraag over de uitzending? Schrijf ons. Onze medewerkers beantwoorden graag jouw vragen. Contact at joyce-meyer.nl